Hi, this is Chuck Braverman and you're watching Westock Online. And before we begin, I want to tell you Westock Online is made possible in part by Real Screen magazine and Real Screen is brought is a magazine that's online and it's a print magazine and if you're in the documentary and reality business, you should go to realscreen.com and get on their list and get their their print and their online uh, news and newsletters. It's uh, it's really important to know what's going on. And they put on a, uh, a summit uh, twice a year. Real Screen West is out here on the West Coast and Real Screen Summit is coming up January 27th to the 30th in New Orleans. And if you click on the bottom of the page at westdocconline.com, there's a link that'll take you right into registration to Real Screen. So um, do that. I, I promise you that you, you will enjoy it and you'll meet lots of people, especially commissioning editors who uh, can tell you how you can sell a project to them. So we have a fascinating guest today and he actually has two unbelievably rewarding, wonderful films. And here's the trailer for the first. What you're about to witness is strictly personal, a direct, undiluted, unrehearsed, uncensored interview. My role is that of a reporter. The mention of my first guest's name has been known to strike fear into the hearts of brave men and women. I'm Mike Wallace. I'm Mike Wallace. I'm Mike Wallace. I'm Mike Wallace. He was tough as nails, never took orders from anybody. Why are you sometimes such a prick? <laughs> People didn't ask tough questions back then. You invented that genre. You're not answering the specific question that I put. You ask tough questions that get behind the facade. I've never seen an interview that you did not dominate. It was my first. I'll ask the question, please. You're a beginning. son of a bitch. Do you know that? Oh, come on. You are a Barbara. son of a bitch. But the folks at CBS News said, come up with an idea. This is 60 Minutes. We were experimenting. We were trying to find out what worked and what didn't work. Nobody thought it was going to last. That's when we began to do the real investigative stuff. We were doing things that were revolutionary. You no right to be here, I ask you to leave. People started to tune in to see what Mike was gonna be up to next. There is a new billionaire in town. Trump's the name. I don't think it's journalism. I think it's show business. Television journalism has been coming under recent criticism. Some polls have shown that public confidence is eroding. U.S. Army General William Westmoreland today filed suit against CBS Incorporated. The press is contemptible. I'd like you to get out of here. Are you aware that what you are doing is seriously endangering people? If you've got a hell of a story on your hands, go after it. Temptation is for television news to go easy. Is Russia a democracy? What we're defending is the people's right to know. And that was the trailer for Mike Wallace is here. And we're going to have the director of the film in just a moment. But I want to tell you about one of our other sponsors, which is Backblaze. And you might say, well, what is Backblaze? Backblaze is a great software program that backs up all your programs, your pictures, your, your videos, your drawings, your documents, anything that you want. It does it in the background. You can set it to, to work at night so it doesn't... Uh, interfere with anything and it's foolproof you don't have to do anything i've been using backblaze for years and if you click on the bottom there's a link at the bottom of the west Dock that says backblaze it'll take you where you can get a 15-day free trial it'll back up back up everything on your computer for six bucks a month so um, i think it's really worth it so our guest today is a very talented uh director who uh happens to be from Israel. And my question to Avi Belkin is, uh, who's Avi Belkin and how did you, how did you get permission <laughs> to do this film? Well, like you said, I'm from Israel and I started working on this film, I think like three years ago. And that was before Trump got elected, but broadcast journalism already felt like it's a problematic spot and very much discussed. It was after Spotlight won the Oscar. And I kind of became obsessed with the question, how did we find ourselves in this tipping point in journalism? And 
I had this idea of doing a small story and through it kind of find the bigger story of journalism. And I was looking for the right character to do it. And Mike had this unparalleled career in broadcast journalism. He has over 60 years of career and basically was in all the right junction points in the story. And I thought that if I would do a portrait of Mike, I can tell a much bigger story through his life and career. And that was the idea, basically. And so I got here and I didn't know anybody here. And I just started to pitch the idea to people. And I met a producer named Rafi Marmor. And we started talking about the idea. And I felt like he really, really got what I was talking about. And he felt like we should go to the family first and then approach CBS. So we talked with the family. We talked with Chris Wallace, his son, and Pauline, his daughter. And they loved the idea that we had for the film and said, let's do it. And then we went to CBS with the family blessing, which made it much easier, I think, to get it. But also we just came at the right time, I think, uh, for CBS. And we got this unprecedented access to this treasure trove of archive materials. And that's how I did the film. So you grew up in Israel. And I'm going to ask you about the film school that you went to in a minute. But how did you even know who Mike Wallace was? <laughs> well, we, I didn't really know him completely. I knew who he was. But we had this uh, illegal satellite when I was a child. So we used to get 60 minutes on and off sometimes. So I knew he was this tough guy. But nothing more than that. Uh, most of the stuff that I knew about him came from the research. And most of the stuff that the film revealed, I don't think a lot of the people know about him from before. Yeah, you know, his background in show business, the fact that he was an actor, the fact that he was prone to depression, tried to commit suicide, all those stuff that the film kind of reveal. And I think as a big reveal also for the audience was a reveal to me as well. Because when I started it, all I knew about Mike was this tough guy persona, this unflinching character. And I think that's the beautiful thing about this story is that when you peel that tough guy and that tough investigator that he was, you see that he was very much like all of us, with insecurities, prone to depression, keep questioning himself and his career choices, and just a beautiful kind of, I think, comforting story about a human being. Yeah, it's, it was brilliant to go to the family, and I'm just curious, were they, how much, if at all, were they involved in the editorial and the production of the film once once you got going? Once we got going, they were not involved at all. At uh, the beginning of it, I went to the family and kind of looked for the you know, family albums and kind of wanted to see if there's any home movies and stuff like that. But very early on, when I made the decision to do an all archival film, I felt like I'm going to try to do it without using still pictures or letters or stuff like that, just keeping it constantly moving with video imagery. So at the end of the day, we didn't even use nothing from the estate, just, you know, his archive footage. So his family was not involved in any way. The only moment they got involved was the, when we found we got into Sundance, which we premiered the film on January. We called Chris and asked them if he wants to see the film before we show it in Sundance. The film was already finished. And so five days before uh, Sundance, he came to see the film for the first time in LA, which was a very obviously scary moment, uh, but he really loved the film, but he had no creative control. The family was not involved creatively. So other than giving us the blessing in the beginning and loving the film when it finished, no involvement basically. As a filmmaker, I, 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 can, I know how scary it is to show people who were the subject of the film. Yeah. I mean, on the one hand, you're sort of excited and you want them to say how great it is. On the other hand, you're horrified because what if Chris Wallace had said, gee, that's not the way I want to see my father. <laughs> it's always scary to show people your film anyway. And, you know, when it's the son of the person, it's like terrifying for sure. Uh, yeah, but I felt like from the beginning, I felt like I really had an insight into who Mike was. And I felt like the movie captured him very honestly. And I felt in Mike's legacy, in a way, it didn't hold back any punches. I think Mike wouldn't want it to be, a, you know, a puffy. And I think it showed Mike who he was, which is a complex person, not all good, 
not all bad, obviously, a very driven person that for the sake of work and professional, he basically decided that he's going to, you know, choose career over family. And I think in the movie he says that he was an absentee father and Chris talks about it a lot as well. So there was no sugar coating on who he was. But on the other hand, I felt like the movie does a great service to his legacy in reminding people how influential he was in forming what we consider today the norm and the template of broadcast journalism. Well, also, it it uh, brought up a lot of memories for me and to see him, you know, selling cigarettes and to selling lipstick and and all kinds of other things. Now, if I told you that I actually met Mike Wallace, <laughs> would you be surprised? It's true. <laughs> I will be a little bit surprised, but not too much. A lot of people met him. A lot of people come to me and tell me that they met him. Yeah. So I'll tell you, I mean, as soon as I saw the trailer for this film or saw that there was a trailer, I mean, I immediately went to see the trailer and then I saw the film. In 1968, I had just gotten out of film school and I worked at CBS off and on for as a stringer. And in 68, I was trying to get into the union to be a cameraman. And I worked in the basement at CBS, and I ended up selling a film to another show, which you might have watched on satellite. No, you might be too young, but no, I'm, I'm sure you're too young, but it was called the, Smother, the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. And and part of the film, beside being on the Smothers Brothers, the show uh, was on 60 Minutes. The, the film American Time Capsule was on 60 Minutes, but I made another film for 60 Minutes called The World of 68. So I went back, I met Don Hewitt, who was executive producer, and all the correspondents, including Mike Wallace, who was exactly, as you've shown him in the film, he was Mike Wallace, but it's, it's sort of interesting to see him there um, in the film. So, uh, you know, watching the film, it, it, it's absolutely amazing the different steps that you, you go through. And as you say, peeling back the onion in the film as to who he is and uh, what a character and what a complete... Yeah. Life, but I think when he revealed himself that his biggest regret was not being there for his family as much, it seemed to be uh, an incredible moment in the film. Where if he had to do it over again, maybe, maybe he would have chosen That's the differently. Question. I don't know. I, I, I don't think so. No, I don't think he would have chosen differently. What I do think is very interesting is that this film allowed me as a filmmaker to. To have someone on both sides, in a way, because when you do a documentary, obviously you have interviews with people who you're doing the film about, but they're not the one doing the interviews as well. And Mike offered this opportunity of a guy who's not only the interviewee, but also the interviewer. So there was an opportunity to build this film, like a back and forth of questions and answers between Mike playing both roles, in a way. And I think that's what's fascinating about that. And the moment where he's talking about him being an absentee father, I think in, a, in the movie it plays very nice because you kind of feel like Mike is almost doing a Mike Wallace interview with himself. And he gets himself to be honest about how he feels about his family, about his career. But I think Mike, and that's something that's very interesting. I watched hours of interviews from hours, like over a thousand hours of interviews with people. And most of them are like the most iconic people of the 20th century from all fields. And they almost, all of them talk about making a sacrifice and preferring career jobs over family. It's something that they had to do in a way to become great at what they do. Betty Davis talked about it. She was married six times. Uh, Larry, Dave, uh, Larry King, sorry, was married eight times. Mike was married four times, etc. They all kind of sacrificed their family for their careers, and I think they wouldn't change it at the end. I think in many ways, maybe it's a little bit the price you have to pay for being so good at what you do. And I think they both and all of them kind of talked about how career is the only thing that stood by them their entire life, the only constant that was really there. Let's take a look at another clip from the film and we can discuss. 
how much in the retirement packages of the people who have voted okay on this, how much are they getting? Answer the question. It's a very simple question, Mr. Sullivan. Why are you so reluctant? Why are you so reluctant? You want to get over here, Mike. You want to just get right over here. You're kind of the last man standing in this line of work of your generation. <laughs> you have some tough questions left? Sure. Have them run out? You're in good shape, yes. It's <laughs> remarkable. You too. You too. Yeah, really. Well, for 87. Could somebody please tell me what's going on with the. It's now working. They're doing a test for you. What's that? They're doing a sound test for you. I can barely hear. I'm deaf. I can't see very well. <laughs> oh, there we go. Corruption is every place in Russia. To get anything done, money. Is Russia a democracy? Russia is a конечно democracy. In order to be a journalist today in Russia, do you have to, in effect, bow the head and bend the knee to Putin? Даже если бы власти захотели контролировать всю эту массу, огромную массу средств массовой информации, это практически невозможно. Your people run these news channels. One channel even begins each newscast with what did Putin do today? Who did he see? What does and so forth and so forth. По отношению ко мне, во-первых, существует оппозиция, и не маленькая. Во-вторых, оппозиция имеет возможность высказывать свое мнение открыто. Where? Your English is really very, very good, isn't it? You understand every word that I'm saying. You don't need the, the translation. What would you like to say to the American people? All the best to uh, every family in America. Good luck. Do you feel it's time to maybe pack it in and reflect? Or reflect is... about what? Give me a break. What am I going to reflect about? What? Well, if I can ask, you don't have to be specific, but uh, did you use in fair use at all on this show? Or did you have to pay for every single clip you had from CBS? Did you get some kind of a deal from them? Or how did that work? Because it's... Well, the details of the deal is obviously the producer were down with it, but we didn't do a lot of fair use, no. I think we paid CBS uh, some sort of bulk sum of money and we got access to, you know, all the 60 Minutes and all my stuff that they did with them. I think in general, obviously, if you have the budget and if you don't, you know, absolutely have to, I would, I prefer not to use fair trade, fair use, sorry just a situation that you get a better quality of the footage and you get the full footage, sometimes we get out, outtakes and stuff like that. But in this film, we didn't use a lot of, uh, a lot of footage that was not licensed. For, for years, you know, uh, if you wanted to buy footage from any of the networks, you could buy footage, but they always said you can't use the on-camera people, which more and more that rule has disappeared. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Is there? It's sort of ironic that you're making a film about <laughs> Mike Wallace in a way, but uh, it's a fabulous film. And so now that we've covered Mike Wallace for a minute, you know, and we haven't really discovered yet who Avi Belkin is, I'm going to run a clip from another film, which is absolutely also amazing, and we can talk about. How no one saw a thing. I was glad he was dead. Killing him was the only way it was going to stop. Skidmore, Missouri. It's one of America's most puzzling murders. It's where they killed the town bully, right in front of this bar. You have the wife's statement. I saw him fire the gun, and he killed my husband. 
That was the one mistake that they made, was that they didn't kill his wife. I would have killed his wife. I was proud they had killed him. Because this town was so full of sin. No one talked. Everyone stuck together. There was a major cover-up of all the people in that town. Was it murder? Yes. What did it do to the people? It changed them forever. I counted nine mysterious deaths since Ken Rex died. He stomped her to death. Dragged her body. Impaled by a stake. Strangled to death. They just well have charged Skidmore, Missouri as a whole. So you're the director on this miniseries, which is on yeah. uh, is AMC <laughs> Sundance. Yeah. And was this a... Uh, were you involved in the developing of this project? I mean, because there were a lot of CBS News. I think Morley Safer is in this. And, or I'm trying to. Yeah, they kind of. Right. So was that a coincidence, or is it just how is it that this show comes out around the same time? First of all, yeah, definitely a happy accident with the Morley. When I was doing the mic, a wall of film, I found that story in the in the archive, right. and then obviously that's a very lucky accident. Uh, so those two films basically started together. I was doing them together. At some point, some point, a few months, I was working in four editing rooms simultaneously, just basically editing three episodes and editing the Mike Wallace together. So they kind of happened together. I came into America with two ideas. One was the Mike Wallace, and the other one was Kidmore. It was this town that you saw. And when I got here... It takes time, obviously, to set up a film, to get the, the budget, to get the actors, etc. So the Mike Wallace took time, and while it took time, I just flew to Skidmore. We, I took two friends of mine, and we just flew to Skidmore, and I started shooting in that town, just started to talking to people. People talked to me. I think uh, it was definitely the first time they ever saw an Israeli in town, and I think it was a little bit of an attraction. And... When I got back, I cut this sizzle from what I shot, and Glamout, is a production company, they saw the season and really loved it, and basically wanted to produce that. And so both ideas kind of came together, and they, I think, one month apart came. Like Magnolia released Mike Wallace in July, and in August, the film, the series premiered in uh, AMC. So it's definitely. Uh, a heavy two years that I've been into, basically. So just to repeat, did you find the Skidmore? In piece? Israel. Oh, in Israel. So you came here. Yeah. So it wasn't like you just stumbled over a piece. No, no, like no. I came, I, came to, I came to America very well prepared. I came with two ideas, the Mike Wallace and the, the series, and just managed to get them done. Well, I, I, I've got to tell you, the Skidmore piece is, is so good. That, Thank you. And I say this, and I don't know how to, to say this in the right way, except that you forget that you're watching a documentary. It's like a movie. It's like a dramatic uh, murder mystery movie. And it's so well shot. And then, by the way, I've noticed that you're one of the DPs on the show, too. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah. uh, I'm surprised you didn't <laughs> do sound and craft services, too. I right? did. <laughs> I did. I just did right. In Israel, we do everything, man. When when you do a film in Israel, you make the coffee, you do sound, you produce, you do everything. So I, the good thing in it that I learned to do all positions. So when I started this project, all the first two trips, I was alone. I was shooting, I was doing sound, I was producing it, directing it, etc. And then when we, you know, got funding and became bigger, so we added cinematographers. But I was always shooting. And I also shot a lot of the 8 millimeter footage on the series. Uh, that's how I kind of started the film. I started the, the cinematographer, the photographer of still pictures. So I always had that in the background, I would say. What do you have coming up now? I'll be very disappointed if you don't have six projects that are about to come out in a month. I don't know. <laughs> I think two. Two are supposed to come out, not in a month, but I'm working on two projects now. I can't really discuss specifics, I'm sorry, but it's one is a film, one is a TV series, and I'm excited about it. I, I think I think one of them is going to be different, but one of them is going to be a little bit the same. 
<laughs> so, so the the Wallace show uh, was distributed by Magnolia or is being distributed Magnolia theatrically. Yeah. Is there? Do you know? Is there a television sale yet? Are we going to be able yeah, to see Hulu. this? Yeah, oh, Hulu. Hulu is going to happen. Going on Hulu, I think, end of October. Such such a fabulous such a fabulous film and Skidmore. Thank you so much. I'm, I want to run one more clip from Skidmore. Here we go. Good. I don't really think of Skidmore is any different than any of the other little towns that I've lived around. Pretty complacent. Not much happens. Sit around and watch the grass grow and the cars rust. <sighs> But it just hit me about three weeks ago. Uh, somebody was crowing about, God, oh, don't mess with love, where's your skid marks? And it just hit me. It just hit me. This guy, no matter how bad he was or what, they had him outnumbered 60 to 1. And they shot him in the back. Now, I'm asking a lot of times. Why can this be 40 years ago and nobody's come forward with a name? People have come forward with a name since day one. How's this been kept quiet? It hasn't been. They've hit it right there on Main Street. I said, aren't you ever going to quit talking? No, I got new people to talk to. Oh. You ain't come seen me for three or four days, so I ain't had nobody to talk to. Oh, I see. So now I got new people telling my stories, too. No. <laughs> no, but they're letting me talk. Yeah. I wish there was a way, and me not get shot, that I could write a true story from McElroy up to now. But I know if I would open my mouth, it wouldn't be long to be shot. Two characters. <laughs> so they're all characters. They're unbelievable yeah. characters. Mm -hmm. um, just jumping back for a second, Midrasha University, where you went to film school, what was mm -hmm. that like? It was long. We went, I went to film school for five years. So the fifth year you're doing a film. And the Midrasha is like this art college in uh, close to Tel Aviv. It's a cool place, but it was very long. Uh, but it gave me all the foundation that basically I'm working with right now. I was more into scripted films when I was doing the film school, but I also did a few short documentary. And in recent years, I found myself more and more drawn to documentary, actually. There's something about the form that is so free. I mean, it's like the Wild West. Anything goes. You can do whatever you want in the story. And I find it very challenging. When you left Israel to come here with these two ideas, did you have any idea that a couple of years later you'd actually have these projects produced and on the air and so well put together <laughs> and, and so well received? You know, both of them are really fantastic. Yeah. Knock on wood. Uh, I mean, in a way, yes, you know, that's what we do. We dream uh, a project and we go and set out to do it. Uh, so I felt like it's possible. But to tell you the truth, I wasn't sure, obviously. I didn't know anybody here, so it was a long shot. Uh, but I felt like I know what I was doing, and I felt like the ideas were good. Uh, but it has turned out great. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Avi. Uh, you've been a terrific guest, and congratulations on both your films. Uh, I, I would recommend anybody, if you can, still go to a theater and see uh, Mike Wallace is here and tune in to Sundance Channel. Is it Sundance Channel or is it AMC or is it is it both? Or? It's, AM, it's Sundance TV now. They rebranded it from Sundance Channel and it's uh, yeah owned by AMC. It's a great it's a great mini series and it's very entertaining. Well done. Congratulations. Thank you so much. It's a, it's an amazing thing actually. Cincinnati. This is incredible.